Hi guys, we're doing something different today. Um, everybody's been asking for my story. So we finally put some things together and we've got everybody here and we're gonna talk about it a little bit. Uh, first off, I'd like to introduce you to everybody because I really haven't formally done that in the videos that I've made yet. So we're gonna start out to my left right here is my wife, Corky. We've been married since 1996 and we have one child, her name is Kylie, and you have seen her in a couple of the videos because she's been helping do some of them. That's Kylie over there. <laughs> then to my right is my dad. Um, I've been helping my dad and working with my dad for a lot of years, ever since I was old enough to walk. I've been following him around and doing different things with him. But that's my dad right there. His, oh. his name's Tom. <laughs> and then my mother, that's my mother, her name's Hi. Pat. She's been my mom all my life. <laughs> That's my brother Matt over there. Uh, I don't know if you've caught him in any of the, I don't think he's been in any of the videos yet, but uh, he'll be getting in some here before too long. Beside Corky is uh, my sister Kathy. Um, she's been my sister all my life. <laughs> and she's been, she's been a very big help to me when I was growing up. She was a very big help. And my brother was too. Um, they did a lot of things that most people would never ask somebody to do. They helped me do. But uh, I was born November 24th of 1969, uh, just down the road at Urbana, just down the road from where I live. And uh, went through life just the first couple of years, just a normal person. And then uh, July 18th, 1972, I had an accident and I lost both arms. Well, it was sort of wet year. We were doing wheat on July the 18th, and uh, we were, it was wet, so we were gonna try to dry some, and uh, we're unloading out of a gravity wagon into a holding bin, and, I don't. I wasn't around, but uh, I don't know what happened. But somehow Andy got into it, and my dad was there. But uh, fortunately, because he saved his well, life. Yeah, probably did. Yeah. Because I think his dad had been reaching in to catch a sample, not down in the auger, but underneath the wagon. where the wagon, and Andy saw him doing that, and I. He said he told you to step back, told them to step back, because Kathy and Andy were both out there. And he turned around to turn the auger off, and Andy must have reached in to get a sample, and it grabbed one arm, and it didn't have a guard on it. We didn't realize you could even have a guard at that time. And it pulled the other arm in, and then it pulled it down, so he cut his face. I uh, ended up with over a hundred stitches across his lip and the only time you ever notice that if he's real tired it droops a little bit. But uh, I was upstairs painting in Andy's room as a matter of fact and uh, I heard Vic yell for me and that Tom, it was Tom's dad. I came running downstairs and uh, Vic was walking with him with his hands compressing both sides uh, up to the door and uh, so I grabbed, a, we had a sink out on the porch and I grabbed several towels and threw them in the sink, ran water on them to get them real cold, and then we wrapped those around him and of course I came in and called the ambulance and Kathy had scared her half to death and she ran in the house and hid. What were you doing? I was right there with you. So you pushed me in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I, it comes back every once in a while, I remember. You did, you reached in. And it just went in. Hmm. Well? We had to go find her. I had to go find her in the house before we could leave for the hospital because she went dead. So then I had to run out to the field uh, here in front of our house to get Tom because he was raking and uh, got him stopped and then they came in and then the ambulance, we had to call the ambulance, and the local ambulance was the funeral home. That was what we had at that time. But fortunately, one of the men that came had been in Vietnam and uh, had worked with children even, and he came in and 
then Tom and Bick, Tom and his dad, had to retrieve the arms because they had started up the auger. And they had to retrieve those and they put them in a bucket. And um, off we went to the hospital and emergency care. Fortunately, the one man who was uh, on duty there at the hospital uh, had also been in Vietnam. And he uh, had worked with in a ch children's hospital someplace, I don't remember where, for uh, one of his terms. And um, he prepared Andy and pre they infused the arms and that type thing and packed them in ice. And uh, we really hope that they might be able to put the left arm back on because the left arm was just a straight cut and uh, we were they were starting to do some things like that but the right arm you didn't think could be done because no. it had cut three or four places yeah so now one thing you got to understand also is i never once lost consciousness over this now i don't remember any of it at least i don't think that i do but uh, I never once lost consciousness over this. I remember being in the ambulance, and I think I remember being in the hospital. But other than that, I don't remember too much. You didn't lose consciousness because your grandfather actually walked you up to the house, and you, you didn't lose consciousness. I, it sounds sort of silly maybe to say this, but you actually sort of said you had to go to the bathroom and here you were, I mean, it was just such a uh, silly scene of you standing there and you didn't want to go in your pants and, and uh, you, can, you can eliminate some of that. Sure but did. I mean, it just shows some of the things that happened at that time that- That's what we want to hear. That yeah. just was so ironic. And uh, yet we managed to, getting pottied and before we even got in the ambulance and left for Urbana and the emergency room staff was just and fantastic and we happen to know several of them pretty well too so they were all really really on top of things with with Andy mm -hmm. and our minister came and uh, right away and uh, Tom rode in the ambulance then with him to Columbus and our minister took my mother and me to um, to Columbus Kathy went with Tom's brother, John, and his wife. Well, if this would have happened today, I'm sure they could have put his arm back on. Mm -hmm. Because it took us about four hours to get to Columbus. And then we even got lost. We went south of Columbus and then came back up to Children's Hospital. You didn't have your navy turned on? <laughs> no, I don't think so. You didn't have it on your GPS? No, my phone, <laughs> phone wasn't thing. working. But... Uh, oh. Now, I'm sure with the helicopters and stuff, you could be at the hospital within a half hour, probably. Well, Dr. Iring, help. Dr. Iring, who was the surgeon that they called in from a tennis match to uh, work on him, uh, made no go. I mean, we were praying that they could put that arm on, but he came out and, and he pulled us aside and said, now, I know you really wanted hope that we could put this on. I'm five years away from that. He says five years from now wow. we could have, but uh, you'll never believe, he'll say, he said, how much he will use that piece of arm that he has left. And I kept as much of it, I mean, it, and, and bandaged up as much of it as I could because, you, and as I said, you will never believe how much he'll, he'll use that. And he was right. How long was I in the hospital? That that first initial, or right after the accident? Five weeks. Five weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, we in, when he was in intensive care, the children that were in intensive care with him were all in worse shape than he was, mm -hmm. and that actually helped us maybe get our feet on the ground a little bit about it because. We thought it was the worst thing that could ever happen. And these kids, some of these children were in the process of dying. And uh, he asked us one time, uh, the very first night he asked us, he said, get my arms out. I mean, he was a pretty good talker, even at two and a half. And, but he, you know, it felt like he was wrapped tight. He wanted to get his arms out. And I said, well, 
Eddie, you were in an accident and you, you lost your arms. You'll never have those arms again. He never mentioned again. That was it. About two weeks later, he was, he became a, a, one of the favorites of the nurses. And they would let him sit on the foot, foot part of a wheelchair and then they'd push him all over the place. <laughs> and he'd go on rounds with them. But he was in his bed. I was sitting in a chair beside him. And I don't know if he said I'm cold or whatever, but I was, I think probably I was going to get up and cover him up. And he took his toes, these two, and he reached down and grabbed a hold of the binding on the blanket and he flipped it up in the air and I swear it landed perfectly on him. And from that moment on, I knew he'd be okay. Yeah. How long was it until I, like, maybe I started using my feet? Was that about the first time you saw me do something with my foot? Yeah, and then you, you started <clears throat> feeding yourself right away with your feet. I don't know. I, I, from then on, you had quite a bit of therapy while you were there. They took you down to therapy one day because they thought you would have, they said if you're born with a bilateral amputation, you don't have problem with balance because that's all you've known. Mm -hmm. But anyone that comes in that's had a traumatic amputation generally has a lot of problems with balance and they went and see. He went down there and stood on one foot and did something and, and uh, we, no, problem. no problem whatsoever. So from that point on, everything they did with him, they were learning from and they were filming because they had never had a situation like that before, even his biggest children's hospital in Columbus was. We got hooked up with wonderful people. We just, we just had wonderful care all the way through. The one thing that was a problem as a result of the, the left part of his side was that the bone growth cells continued to grow. Mm -hmm. So every year for nine, about nine years or eight years. It was for, through first grade. Through first grade. Every year the, the bone would grow out the end of the arm. And so we'd have to go in and start grinding and he could feel it, you know. Ugh. And... Uh, it would start to break through and so we had to go over and he had to go into surgery and um, then they had to trim that bone up and then cover that over again and leave enough so he had a little bit of a pad because at that point we were preparing to get a prosthesis for him. And um, never failed every spring. Uh, he had to have that surgery and finally, I remember before the last one, he said, I don't want to be put to sleep. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think Dr. Iring asked him why and he said, because it always makes me sick. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, I, I'll have to give you a lot, quite a few shots to numb that area if, if you know, if you don't want to go to sleep. He said he didn't care. And Dr. Iring said he was a trooper. He said he shot him up all the way around it and in it and everything like that. And he yeah. said the only problem he had with doing the surgery was Andy wanted to watch what he was doing <laughs> and he kept getting his head in the way of what he was trying to yep. stitch. And he thought that was really, he got such a bang out of that mm -hmm. that, uh, um, that he had to do that. But. I'll explain a little bit here. Um, on my left side I have a shoulder and part of an arm, it comes down to about right here. And then on my right side, I have no shoulder. Nothing at all over there, it's just my side. So, for you to haven't figured that out yet, that's the reason that I wanted to throw that in there. But uh, with the bone spur and growing like I was, when you're three, four, five, six, seven, you know, that's the reason that the bone spur was growing out of there. They finally decided to do, they, came, they got together with the prosthetic man, um, Wade Barghausen, who was a wonderful man, or still, might still be. Um, <clears throat> he and the head of the rehabilitation hospital in Columbus at Ohio State and uh, the nurse and, and all these got together and they came up with a plan. They took a skin graft from back here, about like that, 
and took that off and they wrapped that around the arm to make a nice deep strong pad so that the bone could grow down into that and that that was that was pretty painful when they ripped that mesh off of his behind that first time uh, yeah that wasn't very pleasant yeah. but i was awake through one of those surgeries there too um they had that skin attached to my side for a while there was three surgeries in that one was the initial grafting and then the, another one was the middle one was cutting the skin away and then the third one was i can't remember what it was yeah they wanted to keep a blood supply going to that <clears throat> graft yeah. that was on your arm that was like three weeks in the hospital that time and that's the last time that i've been operated on when I was in the first grade. So what they did was it worked. And they thought that that way, when they fit the prosthesis on, he would have enough thickness there that it wouldn't bind or it wouldn't bother him. Wouldn't rub and hurt him. This is my first prosthesis. I would wear this thing and I would sweat and it would get in the way. Now mom and dad wanted me to wear this because that's, they thought that was the thing to do. Yes. And I've had, I wore this one until I grew out of it and then I had another one and I can't find it and it actually had a button inside here and it would make the elbow go up and down. This one's a manual one. But like I say, this is 73 technology here. But uh, then I had another prosthesis. My, this one was the latest one I had. This one was where I drew the line. We were not ever going to wear another one until I absolutely had to. By the time I would put this on and do something and screw it up, doing it with that thing, because I'm not used to using that, I could do it with this. Three times as fast. So, decided one day I was never wearing it again, and I never did. Now, someday, maybe it'll be a, an option, but for right now, it's not. He came home in the first grade and cried and said, by the time I get my pencil holder in my hook, and I get my hook ready to write, and I get the elbow thing at the right point, I could have had it done with my toes. Now, when you come home from school and you use that kind of logic at age six, he took it off and that was it. That was the end. Growing up, there wasn't anybody that could teach me anything <laughs> because nobody knew anybody that was like me. And I pretty much taught myself everything. Um, about anything that I, that I can do right now, I've pretty much taught myself to do. You know, physically, not knowledge-wise, but physically. Well, of course, he, you know, had to figure out ways to uh, brush his teeth and and uh, go to the bathroom, get clothes on and off, underwear and, and jeans and that type thing. And we tried several different little tips that people would give us. We tried several things, but in the long run, he, all once he was dressed, and coming out and I didn't have to help him with anything like that anymore so it was just a natural progression of him experimenting and trial and error to get it of course he might have his clothes on backwards but no he didn't <laughs> that's the style back then. yeah <laughs> mad as he started to grow up then they just laughed and they made Matt do everything for him. Matt, go get this. Matt, go get that. Do this, do that, do that. Matt did it because he didn't know any different. Yeah, it's not our fault he didn't know any different. <laughs> <laughs> Matt really helped me a lot also. It's, it's crazy that you, have, you ask your brothers and sisters to help you do things that they don't normally do with other brothers and sisters. But they helped me and didn't bat an eye at it. And I really appreciate that. Well, say we get, it's just what you do. Yeah. Family. It was you. I mean, it wasn't, it was just normal. 
I didn't know any different. Yeah. I I, right. I, I didn't I grew, know. You grew up this yeah, way. I didn't know anything about how he acted before or what what he did before. That's because when I was born, it had already happened. So that's just what I thought it was, and I never even thought, never even thought twice about it. It was the norm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, he just didn't have arms. Yeah. All well, right. and it's funny because like your Matt has two daughters, and just one day they're like, oh, Uncle Andy doesn't have arms. You know, you, they you don't even think about it. You know, it's just when Uncle Andy. Yeah. yeah. You know, and then they it dawns on them that Uncle Andy's different. And then it's just and then nothing else was ever said about no. that. It was no. they found out what happened. I was just like, oh, okay. Yeah. And. But it was it was it was different for me, I suppose, than anybody else because that's just how I grew up with Andy doing things different, and I guess that's maybe why I never even questioned it. Or I mean, I wondered what happened, but I didn't even think it was anything out of the normal from anybody else. And everybody else did. All my friends at school and people always wanted to know what you know. Why do you do it this way? I was like, well, that's just what we, that's just how we have to do it. And that's just how we do it. And there's still certain things that we do to this day and that way because that's just how Andy does it. It's, it's hard yeah. not to jump in and, and try and help. That was one of the hardest things I have trouble with, or I don't anymore, but when I was, Younger, I wanted to jump in and, and help him because I thought that that I could I could help and maybe do things easier for him. But I think that it got to the point where he probably just said one day, "Just just let me do it." Mm -hmm. And now I think that it's to the point that I just let him do it, and I try to look ahead if there's anything I can have ready for him or do so he doesn't have to do it. It's already ready for him. Then that's, see that way you're helping, and I'm not saying get out of the way. That's right. <laughs> and I think a lot of people are like that. A lot of people are like that because I mean, just like opening a door, or getting a drink out of the drinking fountain. You know, I mean, just little things that everybody takes for granted. You know, I mean, yeah, I can do it. You know, and people always want to jump ahead and grab the door. You know, and, and even getting in my truck. Lots of times. Uh, I'll go into John Deere or one of the parts stores or something. The guys always carry stuff out for me, you know, and then they want to get my door for me, you know. Or if I jump in and ride with somebody that doesn't really know me, they want to open their door, the door for me. But they don't know. You know, that's one of the reasons we do these videos. So people can see that I can do it. And I want to be doing it. We have a little cottage up at the lake, and up at Indian Lake. And... Uh... We go up there, have a lot of family fun up there, and we have a boat, and Andy runs the boat, and he had wave runners, and he'd run all over the lake with his feet up on the handles of the wave runners, and people about wreck their boats. You know, so. <laughs> and he even had a three-wheeler, I think before you, his four-wheeler, and he had a monkey mask. And he used to run up in the long, long State Route 68, oh my flying gosh. up there with that <laughs> monkey, monkey mask, mask on. on with his feet up on the handlebars running this three-wheeler. And <laughs> if he didn't want attention, he sure drew plenty of attention, whether he wanted it or not. So Yeah, if people aren't paying attention to me, I can, I make sure that they do. Boy, Matt and I were over at the Farm Science Review one day, and uh, we were in the steel chainsaw tent. Oh, no. And, you know, we are just in there, just like everybody else was, you know. Matt, he picked up one of these big saws. I forget what it was now. It's a cool one. He picks it up. He says, that's a pretty nice saw. I said, yep, it's one just like cut my arms off. Said it loud enough for people to hear. <laughs> he just set the saw down. We turned around and walked back out of the building there. The looks on the people's faces when we were turning around and walking out was, that was classic. That was, we have fun with it. You've got to have fun with it. You know, you got to joke about it. Chainsaw cut my arms off, a shark. You just, you never know what will tell somebody. What happened to your arms? My dad cut them off. He did get involved with Ohio State in a 
a program for adaptive physical education and he was very fortunate. He started out with a young man by the name of Paul Williams <coughs> and he taught Andy to swim on his back and I mean he can go kiting on his back swimming. He also taught him not to be afraid of anything and they had a diving tower at Ohio State at four years old. He climbs up the ladder to the top of the diving tower and jumps off the diving tower. I mean, four years old, guys, and it, it just, well, then, of course, Kathy didn't want to be outdone, so she went up and did it, too. <laughs> but uh, they, they, that was a wonderful program. Of course, it meant we went to Columbus once a week on Saturday mornings, or and then during the school year, it was on Monday evenings. But I, I think it was a great program. Dr. Walter Ersing, a head of adaptive PE at Ohio State, was the one that got him in that program. It was a good thing, but at the time I sure didn't think it was because we'd be driving out the driveway in the car going to Columbus and my dad would be driving out the driveway on a tractor going to the field mm -hmm. and I wasn't thrilled. Mom asked me a question the other day about did I ever feel like Andy was getting all the attention and I don't think I ever did. That was just how he was and I didn't think anything about it. Well, you were with him and a lot of the time, and you helped him do anything if he needed help on anything. And, uh, of course, Matt didn't come along for a couple more years yet, but... Uh, Kids would look at him and stare at him and laugh at him and it'd make me so mad. I guess that was just being a... Sister. Sister, yeah. I don't I think it ever really bothered you, but... I, sure. And I, I know it still happens to this day. <clears throat> I had trouble with that when we first started dating because it was just, you know, I mean, he's always lived in our community, so I've always known right. him, so I guess it wasn't different for me, but when you go outside of West Liberty or Urbana, <coughs> people Correct. don't yeah. know him, and they do tend to stare and well, things like that. normal, probably. Yeah. When we got pregnant, we talked about, you know, how things were going to happen, you know, when we had the baby. and. He was kind of worried about how he was going to hold her and stuff like that. And so, once she came, we were in the hospital and he got up on the bed and sat down Indian style and then we laid her in his lap and that's how he held her. That's, he always would take his lip and rub her head and stuff and she just loved that. But that's how he would hold her when she was real tiny. And then, I don't even know how it came about, but when she got a little bit older. When she could pull herself up and actually stand in the crib, I would take her left arm and put it over my shoulder and I could hold on to it like this. And I would actually pull her right out of her bed like this and I'd carry her around on my back. It didn't matter if we went to restaurants or what we did, that's how I carried her. But the way she laid though, it's like she knew also. I mean, she, she laid on his back and she was very still, she knew. I mean, it's just weird how things come about. I mean, it's just really weird. Well, one thing, uh, back when we milked cows, we fed a lot of hay and straw, and Andy was a really good uh, tractor driver on the baler. Because you like that tractor. Still my favorite tractor. Yeah. Still got it. But nowadays, we all farm a brother. And uh, Andy, we all farm together, and Andy can do about everything. So he's a big help, and he's got his own land, and we all farm together. So help each other, I think. Yeah, we do. Think we do. It works out well. Yeah. There's a lot of things I can't do still, but we're slowly moving to getting it rounded around so I can. I understand, because I'm not going to be here forever. <laughs> That's right. And we're very fortunate that we live close. All of our family, immediate family, lives within four miles of one another. And all of our extended family through children and grandchildren all live within ten miles of one another. <clears throat> and boy, we are so fortunate to be able to have wonderful times together. and and uh, be very close and I, I don't think we get 
you know, people say, well, how's everything going? And I'll say, well, good, no one's mad at anybody. <laughs> <laughs> They'll say, well, that's good. So, you know, I think some people don't get to see their children or their grandchildren for a year at a time or two years. I just don't know how they do it. I, I just, I just can't imagine not being able to run to one of your houses and see see you. You know, I just they we're really not, lucky. They may not want us to. Well, <laughs> no one's locked the door on us yet. Right. Well, you know the combination to get into our house. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> one thing that I need to bring up about the support for Andy in our community. It's a small community, 1,500 people. But we go to church in Urbana, which is a much larger community, but this community support was fantastic. We had neighbors who came in, mowed our grass, took care of things while we were gone at the hospital. Our church women filled our deep freeze with all kinds of casseroles and material uh, food so that it would be very easy for us to fix things when we were at home. Our grocery store uptown helped out so often, Thoman's Market, and, and uh, I had their son in school, and, and still we do most of our buying there because they're such wonderful people. And uh, we just, the whole community, everyone pulled together. They had a dinner, a benefit dinner for him, and they raised $6,000 in a small community with tickets at $2.50. So that was really something at that time. So I just need to make sure that people understand that we are very fortunate to live where we live. So. It's funny, we had an incident at church just a couple weeks ago. Uh, Patrick and Polly Trenner came up to us with the girls and said they'd been watching Andy's videos and the girls, uh, were just absolutely amazed. And their little one, who's Lucy, uh, I think she's just four. And she was stood there and Polly said, she said, that's just incredible. That's just incredible. Aww. And so when Andy and Corky came to church a week ago and Kylie, the little girls, they saw Andy at the back and they went flying back there right to him to talk to him. They weren't afraid, they weren't fearful, you know. Of course, we know him very well, but they went right to him to, to, to talk to him. And uh, it's just things like that that just really make your heart overflow. It's yeah. wonderful. Well, guys, that's kind of my story in a roundabout way. Um, got a lot of people that ask me how long it takes me to, how long it took me to learn how to do this. This isn't something you learn. This is something that you figure out. And I'm still figuring things out. This is what happened to me and I've had a long time of practice and still doing it, still learning. But uh, thank you for joining me with my family tonight. Um, hope this sheds a little bit of light on my story. And uh, Thank you very much for watching. Your comments are amazing. Thank you very much.